Good morning, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works Workshop. As I said, it's morning here anyway. <laughs> um, looks like we've got a really big program for you this morning. And we've got quite a few comments before we went live. But, um, you know, I put the uh, teaser of the video out there yesterday afternoon. So I thought, well, maybe there'll be even more comments this morning. And no, there's less comments. <laughs> <laughs> so you never, you can't predict anything about YouTube. You can't do it. It's impossible. Just when you think you got something figured out, it'll just throw you a curve every single time. Well, I'll start off with uh, yesterday's uh, topic of the CDs. Um, I read through the emails yesterday afternoon and saw all the people that ordered CDs, and I went ahead and... Uh, processed those. I sent out the invoices and I noticed that some people had paid their invoices already. I thought I'd wait till today to go through all that. Um, and then this morning, while I'm getting ready for this, I remembered I went, I don't have any mailers. So I don't have any way to send the CDs out today, or at least right now i may run into town yet today and try to get some mailers because i'm out of them i i used to well i ordered them by the hundreds um and i've used the last ones i remember now i forgot completely about that that's one of the reasons i took it off the website because i was out of mailers and then i remembered that this morning it's heck to get old um but anyway, I'll, you can rest assured I'll get those in the mail hopefully by tomorrow at the latest, if not yet today. All right, um, let's see. I, re, you know, I tell you all the time, I get viewer letters all the time, and I do. I, every day, I, my inbox is just stuffed all the time, trust me. Not to mention, but it, with these are good. I appreciate these. But what I'm talking about, I also get just gazillions, and I'm sure you do too, junk mail and stuff. And it's just, oh, it's a nightmare just to go through it anymore. But anyway, the, I was going through some of the email yesterday, and I noticed this one here, and I thought it was worthy of reading. I don't read very many letters that I get. I, I literally get dozens upon dozens upon dozens. And uh, I read maybe one out of, you know, two or, two or three or four dozen. I'll re uh, read one, maybe. Well, this one is from Gabe Zinzer, and apparently he's in Nashville. He says, uh, I've been off the radar with YouTube for the past year or so. I just stumbled on your video on your last paid job. I just wanted to say congratulations on your retirement and hitting 100K subscribers. I remember in one of your videos, you said it would be cool to get there. I think it was at the time you had about 80,000 subscribers. That put a big old smile on my face when I saw that you hit 104 today. He says, I also wanted to say thank you for the amazing videos over the years. I remember getting home from school in the eighth grade, going straight to your channel, I'm a freshman in I'm I'm in my freshman year of college in Nashville now. I'm hoping next year I can find a luthier to apprentice with and get into or get into it myself. You've taught me so much about building instruments and I really believe you're the main influence for me wanting to become a luthier. I appreciate you and your videos very much. Cheers, Gabe Zinzer. So thank you, Gabe, very, very much for that very nice letter. Like I said, uh, people are always saying to me, you need to get another apprentice. You need to, you need to have an apprentice. Uh, you know, it, why don't you take on somebody and teach them how to do this? I get letters like that every single day, and I am not kidding. And I'm not trying to have the big head over it or anything. I'm just trying to explain that I really do honestly feel... I've got apprentices all over the world, and uh, from the what I, you know, it's just the feedback I get. Um, I did take on one apprentice, as you know, and that was Caleb, and uh, Caleb's the um, subject of the next topic, and uh, do you know who Tadpole is? Well, only the really hardcore viewers, uh, fans, will know who Tadpole is. You've heard the name, I'm sure, a time or two on the channel. Well, uh, Caleb just fixed Tadpole's guitar. And uh, I'll, I'll just 
leave it to the comments to see if we know who Tadpole is. And uh, if we don't know, and if you'll remind me, I'll tell you when we get toward the end of the comments. Um, but anyway, if you haven't, so there's going to be two people that know. It'll be the hardcore fans that have been watching forever or the ones that have watched Caleb's video. <laughs> Those are the two people that are going to know who Tadpole is. Okay, um, yesterday somebody said, can we take a slightly deeper dive into the uh, slot cutting jig that I made for the guitars? The slot in the saddle, or in the, the s saddle slot that goes in the bridge. And this is what I use. Now the shape is just the shape because it's the shape. It, you don't have to make it this shape, this odd shape that you see here. This, I had a square, just a perfectly, you know, square, square of this plastic. And, you know, if I turned the square, you know, where it went with the grain lines, it wasn't wide enough to go across the guitar. But if I turned it point to point, well, it was just barely wide enough to go across the guitar. And that's what I wanted. I wanted something that spanned almost all the way across the guitar. That way I could clamp it on the ends with a, with a rubber type clamp or something to hold it in place. So if you were making one of these perfectly rectangular would be perfectly fine. This is just what I had. Now this plastic is, is really nice stuff. This is like cutting board plastic, and I don't know the name of it, scientific name of it, but it's, it's, it's exactly like cutting board plastic. It's kind of slick. Um, not that it has to be that, that's just what I used. You could make this out of wood if you really wanted to. Then I, uh, on the bottom of it here, you can see I've got slots cut, and I've got these um, uh, uh, carriage bolts in there. And uh, they slide along those slots. So you can just loosen this up and slide it in or out and get any, get any particular angle you need to match the angle that you want in the slot of the uh, bridge. Um, th this portion right here is where the table of the router rides, right here. Um, let me just get the router here. Well, I don't see it. I don't see that good, good custom one that someone made for me. I, I don't see that one. I don't know what happened. It got misplaced. I'm sure it's here. I just didn't see it. So, and this one's got a jig on it that I don't really want to. It's just complicated. Well, this was my old router base. We'll just use this as an example. But anyway, your router base rides along there. Your cutter comes through here, and, you know, so it's cutting down. The cutter comes through here, so that's actually the thing that's cutting the slot in the bridge. So uh, that's how it works. This is a rest on the other side like this. And again, well, it actually goes this way. It's wide, you put the wider side here. So this can ride on both things and float above the bridge. So you put this on both sides of the bridge like that. So there's a slot in there's a slot in there about like that that you bump it right up to the bridge. I hope that makes sense. Now I put these little foam rubber pads on there. Uh, they're kind of a non-skid pad that helps too so it doesn't slide around. This slick plastic helps so that it that your uh, router slides on it really good. You could do it with wood, um, and if you did with wood, then you might want to wax the wood to make it really slick. Because any anything that uh, uh, can jerk a knot in your tail will jerk a knot in your tail. I mean, you can pretty much bet on that one. Um, so the slicker it is, the better it is, so that it's not grabbing and jerking and pulling the router off the track. The hardest thing about this, and it's really hard, the hardest thing about this is uh, going one way or the other, the, and I can't tell you which way right now because I do it by feel, but one way you go, the router's going to want to pull away from this thing. The other way you go, it's going to want to push into it. So you try to go the way it's going to push into it. And you might have to go to a practice piece and try it until you get it figured out. Um, 
the other thing the other thing that's really hard and that's that's hard in itself because you it the least little bit you pull out you'll see it in your bridge you'll see it i guarantee you, you can't hide it it's going to show up because you put that saddle in there and the saddle fits the slot perfectly and if you pull out even just ten thousandths of an inch you'll see it uh you'll see the mark so um, you, you, it's really hard to do. It really is. And the, uh, so that's the first thing that's really hard is just to make a good, straight, perfect line. And probably harder than that is that, you know, you can't cut it all in one depth, not with a Dremel tool anyway. And uh, or at least, you know, even though I've got a really powerful Dremel tool, and quite honestly, I wouldn't want to try to cut it in one because the deeper you cut, the more it pulls. So you take a shallow cut, you make your uh, cut like that. Then the really hard part, probably the hardest of all of it, is, you know, adjusting it to your next depth, which I've shown that in videos how I adjust it and get the perfect actual depth. That's not the hard part. The hard part is going back down in the slot without screwing it up. Um, yeah, it's really hard to do because even though you've got these two things to set it on, there's always a little bit of this kind of thing going on, a little bit of tilt, you know, just at least a little bit. Or as you're going back down in the slot, you'll hit it or something. And you almost have to have it turned on before you go down in there. Otherwise, because your new depth is going to hold this up off the table. So you have to have it on. You go back down in there with it on to, so that the cutter will cut down into the wood. Otherwise, it's going to sit on top of the wood, and when you turn it on, it's going to jerk and cause more problems. So the hardest thing is to go back down in there and not screw up. That's really, really, really hard. It, this, thing, this whole process has, is a number 10 out of 10. It's a 10 on the pucker factor. If you don't know what the pucker factor is, I'm sorry I can't help you. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what the pucker factor is. But a certain part of your body gets real tense <laughs> and kind of puckers up. If that that might give you an idea if you don't know what it is. All right, so there you go. Um, but that's what it is, and that's all there is to it. It's just it's just basically two slots cut in a rectangular board, and then this board here on top just slides in those slots, and you adjust it the way you want it. Now, I'm very, 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 very careful when I do all this. I mean, you got to take your time. You got to be very careful. Like I said, the pucker factor. And I also, um, you know, I'll, I'll lay it on here and ha with the cutter just barely touching the surface of the bridge, I'll trace uh, the line that I have drawn on the bridge. Uh, I'll trace it multiple times to make sure that the cutter is following that line perfectly. In other words, I usually want to cut directly slightly behind the line. You know, in other words, like maybe dissect the line and have, have the cutter just touching the what would be the front edge of the line, if you will, because the front being towards the neck. Um, it, well, I don't know. That's not the best way to say that. <laughs> that's, that's not the right way to say that. I'm cutting on the back side of the line the neck is down there, and I want to stay on the back side of the line because you know it all depends how you draw the line. That's the thing, and I always draw it so that the back side of the line is the line uh, would be the front edge of the slot. If the, it's really complicated, I'm sorry, I, I don't know how to explain it any better. But the back side of your line that you draw on your bridge is the front side of the slot you're cutting. I don't know how to say it any, any more clear than that. It, it, if that doesn't make sense to you, I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. Anyway, this is a super high pucker factor right here. There's, there's nothing, there's hardly anything you do on an instrument that will give you any more of a pucker factor than this right here. I hope that makes sense to you. Size-wise, I might as well measure it so you guys will have some idea. You know, size-wise, really, you just want to size it so it kind of, if you have the option of building this, you want to make it where it's big enough to fit across the guitar. If I was building a new one, I'd probably make it 16 inches long, and that will be long enough for most 
circumstances. This one's long enough for all of them, and this one's only uh, 14 inches, but I'd probably make it 16 inches, really. I think that'd probably be better, and you can always cut it off if that's too long. And the width of this one is about uh, three and three quarters inches. Um, for uh, my millimeter friends, that's about, it's just under 10 uh, centimeters, so it's about 10 centimeters wide. That's probably a good width if you made it 10 centimeters or four inches would be a, a, probably a real good number. So four inches, 10 centimeters, um, 16 inches or about 40 centimeters. Something like that would be for the length. This piece on top is about two inches or five centimeters roughly. And that's wide and lengthwise, it's about eight inches or 20 centimeters approximately. Um, so those, those are just some rough numbers. This, the other side here doesn't really matter. Again, this was just another piece out of that corner that I had left over. So I just sawed this off and left the length that I had. You know, it was just basically just using what I had. Probably came off of right here. In fact, I'm sure it did. It came off of right there. So this piece was just left over and that's what I use. And, uh, you know, this piece is approximately eight and a half inches by about uh, 22 centimeters long. Width-wise, it's about three inches, eight centimeters approximately is close enough. Um, on this piece here, this is an important piece, you know, and again, I put the non-skid things. You see there's a little cutout here. Now, why do I have that cutout? Well, that kind of accommodates the, um, the uh, pick guard. A lot of pick, you know, most of the time, just, just this pad will accommodate the pick guard. But on some guitars, they have really thick pick guards. And so this just kind of, that little bit of a cut out there helps you go over the pick guard and get more support. I guess that's uh, everything I know about making that thing. And uh, all I can tell you is uh, you might want to take a nerve pill before you start. Because I'm telling you, you want to be calm when you do this. Yeah, I'll just set it there and get it out of my way. All right, moving on. <laughs> I beat that to death and didn't explain that all that well, but I hope it makes sense. Um, someone asked to see a close-up of the yellow rose on the mandolin. So actually, I did a little better than that. I went ahead and made four little photos here, and uh, I'll talk about each one of them. So here's the first one. Okay, this is, I didn't clean this up, by the way, before I took these pictures. You can see dust on there. But uh, anyway, this is a close-up of the peg head. And I never did ever, you know, finally buff all this out. I kind of like the antique -y look of it anyway, to be honest with you. So I, I just really don't feel like I need to buff it out all that much. Although you could make this pretty shiny if you wanted to. Sand it a little bit and buff it out. But uh, you can see the rosa there, that's uh, cut out of um, maple. That's all uh, maple wood, the rosa. The uh, stem and the flower petals, or, or the, uh, I'm sorry, the stem and the leaves are uh, maple also. And then the flower petals themselves are uh, Osage orange. Now you will notice that if you look at that Osage orange, that the grain doesn't run through that flower um, in any one particular direction. In fact, every one of those pieces has the grain running through it in a different direction. And if, if you know anything about wood, you can pretty much tell that every one of those pieces is an individual piece, and they are. And that's what's hard to put back together. If one of those gets flipped over upside down, you'd be surprised how hard it is to tell where it goes and all that. So it's really difficult to do. I mean, you can color one side or something, and that's not a bad idea. But uh, it's a jigsaw puzzle putting that together because it, it looks really big there in this picture. But in reality, it's about the size of your thumbnail. And uh, when you get that many pieces in the size of your thumbnail, it's, uh, I think there's 15 individual yellow pieces there, something like that. So anyway, that's picture number one. Picture number two is just uh, the scroll area primarily there. I, I just thought I'd show you how I did the scroll and how I did all that abalone shell inlay around there. 
And in that area especially, that's pretty hard to do because of the slant that the uh, is going down to. Um, you can see how I carved, you know, how I made that extra body point there and then how I carved uh, the, uh, the scroll kind of to curve around in different places. It's a little different carving than most of them have. And then the large abalone shell button there where the uh, scroll terminates there in the middle. Uh, it, I just, I didn't really know of a better way to do it. I just thought I'll just cover that whole button area with a piece of abalone shell. And that worked out really good. I've done that once before on another mandolin, maybe on Carmine's. I can't remember, honestly. But we'll see Carmine's a little closer here in a minute, and then we'll know because I just don't remember. Um, here's the hand-carved rose in the back. And I pretty much carve a rose in the back of all the mandolins. Uh, or at least I did after about the fourth or fifth one or sixth one. I don't know. It's somewhere in there I started carving a rose on them and I just kept doing it. Um, and, uh, you know, that, you know, the photo's not necessarily real complimentary there, but if, you know, depending on the light, it looks different. Uh, normally it doesn't have that shiny halo around it, but the flash kind of put that on there. But uh, anyway, it, lo it, it looks pretty presentable even when you're up close most of the time and I did that one already okay I just wanted to make sure all right this one here is just a close-up of the vine I drew I, I just hand drew the vine itself and then the roses are just shrunk down roses from the peg head basically is what they are now I did not put those in in individual pieces though the little lines that you see for the petals there are just uh, cut by the laser cutter on the top on the surface of the uh, of the yellow. It's in other words, they're not 15 individual pieces on this one. Uh, they would be way too small. But you can see those are actually the roses are my position dots uh, in this case. If that's not already obvious, which I think it probably is. Um, okay, let's move on to Carmine's mandolin. Here we go. Uh, I just took a, a few shots of it because, um, you know, I, and, and if you look at there on the scroll, you can see I did put a button on his also, an abalone shell button, and there's abalone shell all the way around, and you can see his is a 10-string mandolin. I looked hard to see if I had a picture of the back of the peg head so you could see how I cut the tuning key in half and then put them back together, and I couldn't find a picture of that. So I don't remember if I cut it between the base two, uh, the ones closest to the nut. I, you know, I left two on one side and three on the other is what I did. And I don't remember if I left the two on the uh, nut side there or if I left the uh, two on the uh, end of the peg head side. I just don't remember. Um, but anyway, I just I, I took a razor saw and sawed it in half so that the fine line would be really fine. And then... And, you know, you, you could argue, well, you could cut it with a wide saw, it wouldn't matter. But what I was trying to do was uh, not cut too much of the metal away, because on the back side of the tuning keys, they have little scroll work on there, and so I wanted to match that up as well. So, anyway, I did it, I did it really well, and when you, when you put it together on the back side, it was, you know, just a fine line crack. You could barely tell it was in two pieces. So... And then that, I thought I'd just go ahead and show you the raw wood picture there, um, the, the one that's all white, kind of washed out. But uh, I just thought I'd show you that that was the progress to get it to the uh, picture that's on the upper left. Um, and then you can see the scroll, I drew, and I drew the vine and cut that vine. That was all of the uh, design on this one was all done by hand. It was way before I had a laser cutter. So everything on this one was all done totally by hand. And uh, you can see the rose carved in the back of this one also, and I dyed it red. Um, you know, back then I was using, always using a red or a pink rose, whatever. So anyway, that's the whole uh, Carmine D'Amico uh, mandolin there. And I did put a link in the description of this video to where his mandolin is on display now. It's in some museum and quite honestly I didn't look up anything I didn't even take time to to read the 
the I, the description. Um, that's <laughs> I'm not a good reader anyway, so it always takes me a while. So I need to go back there and look at it myself because I haven't really looked at it. Um, but anyway, there is a link in the description to where the mandolin is being held in some um, instrument museum at this time. And somebody said it was in France. I don't know where it is, to be honest. I just don't know. Um, but anyway... Uh, then, uh, let's see here, make sure I haven't missed anything so far, because I have quite a list today. Um, I think that's everything I was going to cover up to this point. It looks like it is. And uh, now we'll get into the uh, laser cutter, which is the main topic of the video. Someone asked me to take a deep dive into the laser cutter. Well, quite honestly, just like a lot of things go, this didn't go exactly as I planned it, but uh, I think the video will speak for itself, and then we'll talk about a few more things after the video plays. My friends, someone asked me to do a dive into my laser cutter, and it starts with the software here that I'll explain in a second. What this is is a uh, insert that goes in my bandsaw. I'll show you what I'm talking about. It goes in right here. I'm always needing new inserts. This particular insert is too shallow. Uh, it, in other words, things catch on that edge because it's not thick enough. So I need to make a new one anyway. So I'm going to make a new one of these. This was way too thin. I'm going to make it out of thicker material. So the first thing you have to do is use a software. And I think you can use other software, but Inkscape is a very good one for uh, uh, editing graphic type drawings. And uh, it's a free software that you can use for uh, this type of purpose. And it's kind of almost goes hand in hand with the laser cutter. It's almost like it was designed for using it with laser cutters. But regardless, I'm not going to get into the details of how to use this, but you make your drawing and this outline here, that the one that you want cut, has to be in red. And then I think this is in red too, but I, it's hard for me to tell, but I think that's red also and that's gonna be another cutout. So what we have to do is we create the drawing first and we save it, and we have to know where we saved it. And so let's gonna, we're gonna pretend we're done with this, so I'm just gonna close this software out, and then we have to call it up in the uh, laser cutter software itself, which is this software here. It's K40 Whisperer is the name of this software. And then we open a design file, so we'll just go here and it says bandsaw table insert, so we'll use that. And it, it puts it up in the upper left-hand corner. I just typically move it down a little bit because this is going to literally cut right out in the very corner of the laser cutter. So I just like go down maybe one or two and over one or two just because I can't. Don't have to. And then you have different kinds of cutting. On this, the top one is like it fills it in with dark or whatever. The second one is more like you just make little engraving lines. And then the final one is cutting. So we're gonna do the cutting one there. The, the numbers equate to like a speed. I'm gonna go ahead and leave it on the, on the tin. Before we actually click on cut though, we have to go over to the laser cutter and make sure everything's okay over there. So let's go over there, take a look at it. Ordinarily, this vent here would be going outside. I have a pipe right here for it to go outside, but I've moved my whole table and everything around and I don't have it revented. So for the moment, the little bit of smoke that it's gonna create is just gonna come inside. I'm not too worried about it. This laser cutter is called a K40 laser cutter, which is a 40 watt laser cutter. It's only about an eight and a half by 11 area here. Right here is eight and a half by 11 roughly maybe a little bigger than that. And I have a larger piece of wood kind of inserted in here and, and set on here. This is about a quarter inch piece of wood. It's sitting on this table that goes up and down. I've highly modified this machine. I put a little cutoff switch right here. So whenever the uh, lid is open, it won't work. When you press that down, it does uh, enable it and lets it work. I've added a milliamp uh, deal here. My brother Scott says you never want it to go over 20 milliamps. Uh, mine usually stays in the 12 area, so it's really good. It's not a problem. I've also added this feature, which is an adjustable table up and down. And what the most critical thing about cutting things with the laser cutter is to have the top surface exactly the right distance from this laser cutter. I can tell you how I know it's this distance right here. I made this thing up once I... Uh, determine what that perfect distance is, I made this little deal up as a gauge. And what I can do with this, 
And with this is I can raise the whole thing up and down. Like if you'll watch here, I think you can see that I've got space now between here. And as soon as I bring that up to touch, then I'm at the optimal level. So right there is the optimal level. It should cut the best right there. Over here, you have to make adjustments on your powers. I've got it on about 20% of power. So I'm just gonna leave it there. I don't really know if that's good enough or not, but I think it is. And we'll come back, we'll, we'll get the job started. We'll come back, we'll watch it, and we'll watch this meter and see if it's working. So let me close this lid, otherwise it won't work because of that switch. We'll send the job. Quite honestly, I haven't done this in months, so it might not work. You just never know. Things change over time, you know. I'm clicking on vector cut right there. Maybe you can see my mouse moving around. So we'll click on that. It says later laser cutter is not initialized. That's a good point. You're supposed to initialize it up here first. There's an initialization button. I forgot to do that because it's been a while. All right, there, and it talked to it. I could tell. I heard the laser uh, cutter um, kind of jump, if you will. All right, so now we'll click on vector cut. Thank goodness it worked. So we'll walk over here now and you'll see that it is actually cutting the circle. We'll look here, our milliamps is really good, it's below 10, so we're good there. And this is why you need the exhaust out to outside because it's physically cutting the uh, wood and hopefully it's gonna cut the little slot in there. I hope that the 20 power is enough power to get through the quarter inch wood. I really don't know if it is or not. The only way we can know, honestly, is to take it out and see. I just have my doubts that it was good enough, but let's take it out and see. All right, so let me get the wood out of here. I have a feeling it probably wasn't. See, no, it's not nearly good enough. It didn't, it didn't burn all the way through the backside. Okay, I just did a little cutaway on this to see how uh, much it went through. That's the first one. You can see it's about almost, almost halfway, not quite halfway. Turning it up five more, we're about two thirds of the way. Well, I gotta be honest with you, I finally got tired of messing with it. I just went ahead and cut it out on my uh, bandsaw the rest of the way. The advantage of it, that even though is the laser cutter gave me a guide to cut it out with. So it was pretty nice. I was able to just cut it out and then I ran it through my thickness sander and now it's pretty darn smooth. I don't think anything will catch on that now. Much better than this real thin one. Uh, this was way too thin. Okay, so let me talk about some things. Um, first of all, as in most tools, uh, you know, bigger's better, more power's better. You know, the old home improvement show, you know, <laughs> more power, you know, then he, then he would grunt, you know. It's kind of the way it is with these laser cutters. Mine's a small one. I didn't pay very much for it. I think I paid $319, if I remember correctly, for this laser cutter, which seems like a steal in a way because any tool that, you know, and you can do some really nice work with a 40 uh, watt laser cutter. But if you really want to get into the serious and cut some decent material, you probably want the 80 watt version and they make them bigger than that, I think. But an 80 watt would probably cut through that quarter inch material without much trouble at all. This 40 watt, it, it'll do it, but you gotta go over it three or four times. If you don't move the material, you can just send the job again and it'll cut the same exact spot. Send the job again, cut the exact same spot. I mean, it, it's very precise. It'll cut the exact same thing three, four, five times if you need to. And it'll eventually cut all the way through it. But I will say that the, each time you cut it, it pro the next cut g doesn't cut as deep as the first cut because it's now black and it's charred. Now it's trying to cut through that black charred area and it doesn't cut as good as the raw wood does. So, you know, it's, 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 you're chasing your tail to a, a large degree. So it, it would be better to have a more powerful one if you really want to get into it. But then, of course, you're going to spend a lot more money than just the $300 or whatever. Um, that's topic number one. Topic number two is these things don't come with much safety in mind. Um, they're pretty raw 
And uh, like that little safety switch I added, that's just to keep me from doing something stupid and turning it on while I'm under there working on it. Because trust me, you have your finger in there and that thing turns on, it's cutting your finger off, you know. I mean, you're not going to like it at all, you know. Or, um, you know, with that lid open too, uh, that laser beam, you don't want it to hit you in the eye somehow, reflect off of something, come and hit you in the eye. So I, I just thought it would be better or safer if I just made a safety switch so that when you raise the lid, it can't operate. And it can't. In fact, I know that for sure that it works because I've tested it, number one. But number two, uh, if the lid's just slightly ajar, sometimes it doesn't press on the switch properly and it won't work. So I know it works. That part does. The other thing was the table. And that table that I made that goes up and down, uh, that, it, that was really courtesy of one of my wonderful machinist viewers. Uh, he sent me a kind of like a little miniature scissor jack that would, you know, like it, the old type jack that you would have for your car that you spin and it, it would, the scissor would raise up and lift your car. Well, it's just like that except in miniature. So he made me a little miniature scissor jack and he, he, his idea was for me to use it inside of the guitars to press braces. Well, and, and that works. It worked great for that. But once I had this laser cutter and I kept having problems with height adjustment, I thought, man, I could adapt, put that thing inside there and make myself a table that just goes straight up and down, you know. And that, it's just like, it was heaven sent. So I can't remember the fellow's name that sent it to me right now, but I say thank you, thank you, thank you. That really was a super huge improvement to the laser cutter. Now, they don't even come with a table when you get it. Uh, it's it's kind of hokey. So there's a lot of hokiness to these 40-watt laser cutters. So you'll have to, you know, jury rig something to make it work. Um but instead of having to jury rig stuff now, I just use my little table and it works wonderful. Perfect. Uh, so, so just know that they don't really have a very good way for height adjustment. And that's really one of your most critical uh, adjustments. Um, what else? Uh, I put the uh, little meter on there, mainly because Scott kept bugging me. He says, you really need to watch your milliamps. You don't want to get it above, I think, 20. He says, it'll burn your laser up. So I put the little milliamp thing on there. And there's, how did I know how to do this, all these things? Well, actually, uh, for the most part, uh, most of that is out on YouTube. Uh, you'll find people that have modified theirs and have done these things. So I was mostly just copying what somebody else did for the most part. A few of the things I kind of figured out on my own. Well, one of them for sure was the table adjustment. Um, let's see. Um, what else? Um, I'm going to read my notes here because I have a bunch of notes. You got to keep the, you know, the mirrors clean, things like that. There's water that circulates through this thing, and you, there's a water pump and all that. And I didn't show any of that, but that's under the table. I just have a five-gallon bucket of water with a lid on it with a hole drilled through the lid for the intake uh, so that sucks the water, and then another hole through for putting it back in the bucket. So it just recycles the water and keeps the laser cool. Um, you do have to have that. You do have to have an outside vent. Uh, otherwise, you're going to get pretty smoky and it's not going to, you won't enjoy that very much. Um, if, yeah, again, I'll just say one more time about the power. You don't want to get the power too high or you burn up your laser cutter. And Inkscape, that software that I was using there, is really a great graphics program. But I think, and I, I knew all this when I first set all this up. I've, it's been a couple years now, so I don't remember all the details. But I think they call that vectoring software. So it has to be a, a graphics package that can handle vector, vectored images. What all that really means, I don't even really remember either. But uh, you know, the point is, it has to have that uh, capability. So you could probably use it just about any software package for graphics as long as it has vectoring capability. And I just don't remember. Um, I think that's it. That's everything I was going to cover on, I think, everything. So we'll move to the comments and see what we've got going on here. Well, possibly because I set this uh, video out last night, um, 
Uh, Rod wasn't the first one in here this morning. It looks like Bob L. is the first one. And so, hi, Bob. And then Eric Sandell. And Dottie Hildebrand again. Bill Mumbo. There's Rod Wintler. He's about uh, fourth or fifth this morning. Carolyn Fike. Let's see. Blair Turner has a longer one here. I don't see any question marks. And again, if you do want me to talk about something, try to put question marks on it because it sure helps. Who knew that there is a competition happening to see who can be first <laughs> to log into the Roses chat? Is there a prize? I am going to have to get up earlier, I guess. <laughs> Well, there's really no prize, unfortunately. Uh, the, the prize is you get to see my smiling face. <laughs> I can't say that without laughing either. Jeff Pierce, I watched another luthier putting dowels in a headstock to repair uh, tuner holes. I think he used fish glue. The glue shrunk and left gaps. He filled with CA glue. Should have used tight bond. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. If I was going to do that, I would definitely use tight bond for that. That, you know, you're doing when you're doing something that you want to be permanent, then use permanent stuff. You know, and uh, even in a case like that where I know I'm not going to want to take it apart again, I could potentially use tight bond three on something like that because that's waterproof on top of it. So you know. If you know it's something you're never, ever wanting to take apart, ever, 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 then Type Bond 3 would probably be your best choice. Um, okay, Zappa says, uh, Gabe, no hide glue does not pull uh, uh, parts together. No, no, it definitely doesn't pull parts together, that's for sure. Um, I don't know where that came from, but anyway, maybe I've just missed a comment up through there somewhere. Um... Yeah, I don't see it, but maybe there's one up there about that. Uh, so after we went live, it looks like uh, Preston Johnson says, Jerry, why do you have such a different opinion on hydration of your guitars and differences about truss rods from your friend Randy Schartiger? Well, Randy has his ideas and opinions, and that's fine. He can have them. I, I, you know, I won't argue with anything Randy does. He, he's, he's knows what he's doing too. Um, but you know, I don't care what it is in this world. You'll find people with different opinions. Um, not to try to trump anybody or anything. I'm just saying I've done this for 40 years, and I've seen it time and time and time and time and time again. And I know what works and what doesn't, you know. And uh, sometimes what works for you won't work for me and vice versa. So that's just the way I answer it. Um, you know, like, uh, I don't know. It's just the way it is. Um, you can believe what you want. You, you, you can choose to believe whoever you want. I don't really care. It's, it's no skin off my nose one way or the other. Um, I just know what I know. And common sense, I back up to that. It will take you a heck of a long way. I tell you right now, common sense is something that nobody uses anymore. And it's the thing that we should all try to use. And when you stop and think about common sense, it'll tell you a lot of stuff. Um, just like I, on the hydration thing, on the humidity and all that, um, when they dry wood down to a 6% moisture content, which, you know, like green wood out there standing is probably 60-80%. They dry it down to 6%, uh, that's pretty low. And like I said, humidity and moisture content are totally different things. Moisture content can be affected by humidity. But how much moisture is going to leave the guitar when it's 40% humidity in your house? Common sense to tell you, not very much. If you have it down to where you just have a very, very low humidity in your house, sure, over time, a little bit of moisture, maybe a little bit more of that 6% is going to come out. How much more can come out? How much more can it affect your guitar? Not very dang much. Just can't. How much can it swell up? It can swell up like a dang sponge and bust your finish and everything else. Common sense will tell you that if you just stop and think about it. 
You can do what you want. You make up your own mind. I really don't much have a dog in the fight. I mean, other than I'm just trying to tell people to look at these things differently because they've been fed just tons of myths. Is most I, I hate to call them lies because I don't think they're lies. They're just more like myths, just like... You have to use hide glue because you cannot take apart other glues. These wood glues, these people are idiots. You can't use wood glue. You can't take it apart. I got video after video after video where I've taken tight bond apart. It comes apart as consistent as anything on the planet. You know exactly what you're going to get with tight bond, where with hide glue, one time it falls apart. The next time you got to take three chisels and a hammer to get it apart. It, hide glue is very inconsistent. So, again, common sense will tell you some things if you just let common sense take over and rule, you know. But very few people will let common sense rule anymore. They, it's all based on these forums experts. And, and most of the forums experts are guys that have huge egos, and they just have to rule the conversation. Me, I could give a rip. You do whatever you want. It's just perfectly fine with me. I'm just, it's just like my algebra teacher said, I can lead a horse to water, but I cannot make them swim on their back. And, you know, that's the way I feel about it. I, I'll lead you to the water and you can do whatever you want with the water. <laughs> you do whatever you want. Charles Salkowitz. Jerry, thanks a million for this presentation. Really looking forward to it. You're sure welcome. Well, I hope it lived up to it. <laughs> Zappa. Uh, Jeff Pierce, if you don't have to t tap in something is wrong sizes. I'm not sure what that's talking about. Dottie Hildebrandt. Hey, Jerry, yesterday Rod and myself signed in, and today it's not on there. Strange. Signed in. Today it's not on there. I, I don't know what that means either. Sorry. Um, I don't know what that means. Zappa, your secretary's daughter. Uh, it was secretary's granddaughter. But yeah, you're right. Uh, that's who it was. It was uh, so Tadpole was uh, Melissa's granddaughter. And uh, I had given Tadpole was just a real big fan of watching my videos. She liked to watch them all the time. I don't know why, but she did. And they said that she watched them all the time at home. And when she would come here, she'd be super, super, super shy. I mean, like she, she would just hide, hide. I'd try to talk to her, and boy, she would just, she'd just hide. Boy, she could, you couldn't get her out of her shell. After a while, she finally kind of got out of her shell. And she, uh, God bless her, she gave me a little coin. It was a friendship type coin, and she gave it to me, and I carried it for years. And I don't know, something happened, and it ended up getting lost. And I don't know how it got lost. I tried. To, I carried it with my in my pocket every single day. Planned to carry it the rest of my life, but you know how that works. Anyway, I I finally lost it. Um, but anyway, that's who Tadpole is, and I gave her. So it, she really liked music and stuff. So I gave her that little guitar. So people send me stuff all the time, and I was getting, you know, a lot of these little junk things like that, that little gu guitar. But that one was still in decent shape where you could play it. So I gave it to her, and uh, it just, I'm seriously telling you, she carried that little guitar with her everywhere she went. She just loved that guitar. And so that's why Caleb fixed it for her. You know, it's, it was a big deal to her. She really liked that little guitar. <laughs> Nobody messed with it either. You don't mess with her guitar. All right, moving on. Um, uh, it's, it bounced on me here. Give me a second. Wow, it's just, it really, it must have went way further than I thought. Okay, yeah, there, we're, all right, I'm back to Zappa's comment about the daughter there. Okay, uh, Zappa says, Delrin plastic. Um, I guess, I, I don't know, it doesn't seem like the same Delrin that I use out there in the workshop, though. I mean, it, maybe it is Delrin. I, I really don't know. Um, the Delrin I use out there doesn't seem like it's this kind of slick, but maybe it is. Maybe it is. I don't know, because it, maybe it's just in rough form, and you turn it and whatever. It probably is the same, I guess. I just don't know. Um, there's Bill Rhodes from Warrington, Missouri again. Uh, Gene Gambardella. 
Gambardella. Would a plywood guitar benefit by switching the plastic saddle to bone? Um, well, yeah, I think so. I mean, bone is a better uh, sound transfer than the plastic is. And, you know, you know, a lot of people will stand by this tusk plastic. And, yeah, it's a better plastic than your average plastic, but it's still plastic. Your bone is your better transfer. It just transfers the sound better. So, yeah, bone's better. But, again, it just depends on whether or not it's worth the effort. But if it's worth the effort to you, then it's worth it. Paul Akers, uh, thanks, Jerry, for the invite. The Dremel bass is not very good, but I don't do it enough for an expensive bass. Can't figure out the stop on it. I do not really understand your comment there, Paul. Uh, thanks for the invite. I'm not sure what that means. And then uh, how we got on the Dremel bass is not very good. I'm not sure how we got on that either, other than... If you're talking about me showing this Dremel base, I, I don't know. By the way, on this Dremel base, I took off the aluminum one and made this uh, plastic one. And quite honestly, I can't remember exactly why I did that, except that I think it was partly due to the slickness. Um, and I also made a, a circle cutting jig on this one, and I can slide a pin in here and, you know, a pin, and then I can go around in a circle. So I use this for circle cutting and things like that, for like rosettes on the guitars and stuff. And this slick plastic won't scratch the top of the guitar and stuff and the wood. So anyway, that's, you know, I, I modify dang near everything I use, it seems like. Uh, Preston Johnson Jerry, I would love to hear you play Vine Covered Church sometimes in the future. Um, well, I don't know. I, I can give it a shot. I, I, yeah, I'm, not, uh, I'm about to give up music, guys. I'm not, I'm not just saying that. I really am. I'm just about to give it up. Um, I don't know, for a lot of different reasons. traveled highway not even on a dusty gravel road and you have to want to be there when you find it it's not on any maps I know out across the field through the pasture you climb along a steep and rocky trail and when you cross that little creek in the valley You'll see that vine-covered church on the hill That vine-covered church above the valley Where the congregation gathered to pray Built with their hands from the forest Now stands as a marker for the grave I've heard all my stories on that song, but it's it's got some of the most amazing stories to me of anything I've ever done. And it it was a true song, so, sort of. I mean, I'll back up. I'll try to tell us as short as and quick as I can. I tried to write a song about a one-room schoolhouse on my in-law's farm. 
And every time I would sit down to try to write that song, that little vine-covered church would just come right back to the forefront of my head, and I couldn't, I, it's like I couldn't see anything but the darn little vine-covered church, you know. And I had only seen the vine-covered church, I think, one time. I mean, I was high, going down Highway 67 below Farmington, and we were going to a uh, bluegrass festival at Sam A. Baker State Park to play a festival down there. So I saw the little church, and it, it just burned this image in my head, you know. So anyway, for six months, I tried to write this song, and it, that just kept happening. And I just kept stopping writing the song. And then one day I said, well, I guess God's telling me something. I'm supposed to write this song about the vine-covered church. Well, I, So the description on how to find it and all of that was really the description of the little one-room schoolhouse. In other words, up on the hill, through the valley, and all that stuff is the little one-room schoolhouse. It's because technically, the little vine-covered church set right off the highway. So you could see it and find it and all that. But, you know, the whole description that I give there was about the little one-room schoolhouse. Well, anyway, make a long story short, it took me just a few minutes to write the song once I switched to the vine-covered church. And I was done. And, and so then it took me quite a while to get that one. That song, it's not hard. It just switches funny. It switches fast. It's, it's just different than your average three-chord song, if you will. And I, it may have four chords. I can't remember right now. But anyway, it's three or four chords. And it switches odd. So it took me a while. It took me a month or two to get the band up to speed on it at the time. And they just kept having roadblocks, you know, you know, mental blocks with the song. And we just couldn't get it smooth, you know. And so finally we did. And I said, well, gosh, I guess we'll play it this weekend then at, down at the Farmington Auction Barn because we were booked to play down there. So, and that was pretty ironic if you think about it, the fact that the first booking that we play is just down the road from where the little vine-covered church was. Well, we, we played our song and we got off stage and a man just almost came running to me. He came around the stage and, and behind the stage and he grabbed me by the arm and he said, son, I just got to tell you, I really like your song about the vine-covered church, but you know, you do have to change the words, don't you? I said, well, change the words? Why would I need to change the words? He goes, oh, you don't know? And I said, I don't know what? He goes, Oh, well, they just tore that church down yesterday. She said, that church was way over 100 years old. And, you know, it was, you know, and, and anyway, so he did, it just sent chills down my neck. You know, it was, it was as if the song was meant to keep that little church alive. So when you, it's, it was really weird because you add it all up and how long it took to write it and how long it took to be able to play it and all that. And the very first time I play it was the day after they tore it down. So then every single time, and I'm not making this up, you, I know people always think, he's got to be exaggerating, but I'm not. I'm not kidding you. Every single time I played that song for the next year, including out in Dodge City, Kansas, up in Iowa, Illinois, it didn't matter where I played it, down in the boot heel, um, every single time I played that song, somebody would come up and tell me a story about that church. And one of the more memorable ones was, I bet you didn't know, the, the guy says, I bet you didn't know that they used to play bluegrass music in that church. And I said, really? And he goes, yeah, my grandpa played bluegrass music in that little church. So there you go. It was just the most incredible thing. And to this day, I think it's the only song that I've written that other groups you know, national type groups have recorded. The Witcher Brothers out of California recorded it. And it, you know, it did a little splash on the charts. It wasn't like a big hit or nothing. But <clears throat> I did get, you know, royal, quite a few royalty checks on it over the years. Um, but nothing to add up to anything. You, could, you couldn't buy a car with it. <laughs> In fact, I'm not sure you could buy a house. I mean, a, a dog house with it. But anyway, um, that's the whole story. Sorry about digressing again. Let me see here if I can find where I was. Okay, here we go. William, routers are sneaky sometimes. I used to work on during banjo and had to route the slots for the necks to fit. Uh, and yeah, he biffed a few at, at first, but... When I got the hang of it, yeah, it's you definitely want to practice uh, 
you know, yeah, you don't want your very first time to be on a on a finished guitar. Now you might say, well, I always cut the slot first, and then put the and then glue the bridge down to the guitar. Well, and that's the safe way, and that's a, a pretty good way. But the problem with that method is, is that you you know to get perfect intonation when you intonate this and you hang it hang your strings off the back of the guitar like I do and then you float the bridge around underneath it sometimes your bridge is going to be at a weird angle to get the intonation right and sometimes you're you know um you know it it just it just can be weird and it can cause visual looking problems so that's why I do it like I do it I I you know, I put, I float the bridge under there. I also float the saddle, and then I can float the bridge, get the bridge straight, and make it look good, and then and then have the saddle floating on top of that even, and then mark the saddle, mark where I want the bridge to go, glue the bridge down, and then and then come back and cut, and then you know I've got the slot marked already, so now I just come back and cut the slot, and you get almost perfect intonation that way. So it's a way harder to do it that way. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that's the easy way. That's not the easy way. That's why factories don't do it. But that's why factories don't get perfect intonation most of the time. I mean, they get good intonation, but they don't get perfect intonation. There you go. William says, bone is always best. Yep, I agree with that. I, it's bone or antler, either one. And, and, and it's basically the same thing. Antler is a bone. It's the fastest growing bone in the an animal kingdom, uh, antler is. And uh, it's a little harder, I think. And if you just, again, common sense will tell you, they fight with it. And sure, it, even that will break off. Uh, it, they break it, but it's pretty stout stuff. And uh, that's and, and the other main reason I used antler over bone is I, it, it's the main reason is that number one it just falls off the deer so you can get it and secondly um, you don't have to do anything it's instantly ready to use when it falls off the deer it's already cured dried everything you don't it's not going to smell it isn't going to rot uh, you know real green bone out of a like out of a cow's leg at from the butcher. You need to dry that out and let it sit out in the sun a while or something because it's not going to be real pretty if you put it in green. Um, okay, moving on. Zappa says those mandolins are beautiful work. Well, thank you. Uh, Luke F. says, oh, it's already in the description. Yeah, the link to the um, video for the uh, Carmine D'Amico mandolin is already in the description. So you can click on that link. It should take you right there. I don't know if I actually tested it, but I think it should work, because all I did was cut it and paste it. Uh, ben Boyd, do you prefer F-style mandolins over the A-style, and if so, why? Well, I think it's fairly obvious I prefer the F-style, and and I don't want this to sound mean. It, it, I, I don't mean it that way at all. It just, I don't know any other way to say it. If I have to explain why, most likely you won't get it. <laughs> Because <laughs> there, it's just it's just mostly a looks thing. It's just a cosmetic thing. I just think they look cool. They're they're neat looking instruments. Uh, I, that's why I prefer F styles. They're just cool instruments. Um, so if uh, yeah, I don't know if if you prefer A styles, there's nothing wrong with that. I know lots of people that do, and there's nothing wrong with that. And they sound fine. There's nothing wrong with an A style mandolin. Uh, now, the A styles with the round o oval holes and the F styles that have the round oval holes, uh, those sound different. The F holes, if, if all things being equal, in other words, you got an A mandolin with F holes and you got an F style mandolin with F holes, either one of those uh, will sound roughly the same uh, or approximately the same. The oval hole changes the sound significantly. The... Um, other thing that uh, people don't always get on the F-style mandolins is that the F-style doesn't stand for the F-holes. It's got nothing to do with the F-holes. It stands for Florentine, and I think it was Orville Gibson that, in, in, that kind of started the Florentine style of instruments. You know, he made guitars with the scrolls. He made mandocellos with the scrolls. He made all kinds of instruments with scrolls, and that's kind of where the Florentine pattern came from. And Lloyd Lord just kind of took that and ran with that. 
moving on down. Um, Jelvis Skidmark's band says, uh, absolutely beautiful inlay work. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Thank you for watching. Um, yeah, just, I think it scrolled on me again. Doggone it. Ah, doggone it. It, it did. Okay, here, I think I found it again. Uh, Clyde Price uh, says, good morning. Um, okay, I'm, I don't see any question marks. Let's see. Charles has some question marks. Thanks again for the presentation. Recently gained access to a CNC machine that can be laser equipped and might add laser cutter to it. Yep, that'd be cool. Um, Chipwood, do you have a jig that is a go-to, and if so, what is it and what's it used for? Well, that's a big open question. Um, <laughs> that, that's a big open question. I don't, I'm not sure I could... I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's probably an answer, but I'm not sure what it would be right now. I mean... It probably sounds like a cop-out, and it's the one that's freshest in my mind is obviously this jig here. It's probably one that I depended on just about as much as any of them. I don't know. I, I don't know if I could give you a good answer on that one. That's, I just, I'll have to think on that one a little bit. You kind of stumped me on that one. Um, James Akers, Driftwood Guitars uses a laser cutter to cut out the top of the guitar, the center hole, and the inlay as well. Yeah, you could definitely do that. And, and if I had a bigger one, see, mine doesn't accept anything that large. If I had a larger one that could accept a whole guitar top, I probably would do that also. Um, Zappa, homes without humidifiers can drop to 5% in the winter. Yeah, I'm sure they can. Um, mine, we don't have a humidifier, and I and I, and we're using wood heat, and I've never seen it drop that low. Um, but it could, I guess. Our, ours will get down to about twenty percent, something like that. Uh, but even if it gets down to five percent, that doesn't mean that that's below the moisture content in your wood. There are two different things. It affects the moisture content and over a long period of time. And like if you left your guitar in an extremely dry environment over a long period of time, it'll lose some more of that 6%. How much more is it going to lose? It can't lose a ton of more. It might lose another 3% or something. What's that going to do to the shape of the guitar? Very little. Just 3%. You know, out of the whole possible 100%. It's not very much. Common sense will tell you it's not going to drop much. It's not going to dry out much, but it can suck water in like a like a sponge, and it really can. And it'll blow them up and pop the finish and all that good stuff. So you believe what you want. It's just common sense will take you there if you decide to use it. Um, let's see. I'm trying not to. Ex uh, Preston Johnson says, thank you, Jerry, for answering questions about hydration and truss rods. Totally agree with your explanation. Thank you. Jalvis uh, Skidmark says, how much time is involved in doing some, uh, something like your rose in light? Well, if I do it by hand, obviously it's going to take a lot longer. But even the ones cut on the laser cutter, you'd be surprised. Because of the fact that I make the grain turn different on every single pedal and cut out every single pedal individually, that takes a lot of time. You'd be surprised. Just putting that together and getting it to fit tight, uh, it takes more time than you think. It probably takes a couple hours just to put that little jigsaw puzzle together and, and make it satisfy me. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, it, it'll cut it out in under a minute. It, you know, it cuts it out really fast. It's not a problem. But putting it together and getting it to look good and, and then, you know, routing out your space and your... Uh, and you can use the laser cutter to cut uh, your space out, too. Now, the problem with the laser cutter is it doesn't cut as good on black wood as it cuts on, say, white wood. So if you put the black wood in there, like the uh, peghead overlay, you might have to experiment a lot to, to get it to 
uh, raster out the cavity that you want. Uh, see, that if you remember on that software that I showed, um, there was three options. You could say raster it, which means basically just take the head and go back and forth like this and just keep burning that area, and it'll burn that whole area out. Um, or darken it if that's what you're after. I mean, it'll, it'll make it black or it'll cut a hole out in it, and generally it's going to cut a hole out in it even if it's making it black. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to reduce the surface uh, in depth, if you will. So anyway, it, it makes it black, and so that makes a cavity where you can put your inlay down in it. And it's a very accurate cavity. It works really good. So that part's really good. But on black wood, it's a lot harder. It doesn't cut near as deep, and then you'll have, you might have to experiment three or four times to get the depth you need. And It's, it's not simple. It's not black and white, um, even though it is black and white. It's not black and white. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of behind the scenes a lot of you know time invested in lots of ways in doing those even though it's all cut out on the machine you still invest a lot of time in it so i don't really know how to tell you uh, i know if i was doing the whole inlay by hand and doing it out of shell uh it'd probably take a whole day just if you started real early in the morning and you could stick to it you'd probably be five o'clock at night still finishing it up so, I mean, it'd take quite a while. Um, Joe Knoll, Jerry, would you consider selling me some mandolin blanks to build? Stu Mac has hardwood guitar kits and $89.99 price. Well, Joe, um, I'm not interested in selling what I have here, quite honestly. And quite honestly, just the top or just the back of one of my mandolins that I've purchased would cost more than that whole kit. Um, you know, like I, I, like the back would cost, I don't know, 250 bucks, something like that. But I'm buying high-grade stuff, you know. So I'm not really interested in selling any of it. I still have a few sets there. You never know. I might take a notion to build another one, or I might take a notion to maybe one of the grandsons decides they want to build something, and I might want to do that down the road. So I'm going to save it. Not going to get rid of it. Um, Gerald Tacit, or Tackett. Uh, hey, Jerry. Have you seen the Don Brown lower mandolin neck reset? Yes, I have. I've talked about that a time or two here. And uh, McClanahan did a really, really nice job. And I'll say once again for the record, when I took the back off of it, that's all I did. I, back in the 90s, I took the back off that mandolin and put it back on. At that time, that was the only thing that appeared to be loose on the mandolin. And uh, it had come loose three different times and it was sent back to Gibson three different times, and all they did was dob hide glue back in there, and it just kept building up and building up and building up and building up, and it was just a mess. And when Don gave it to me to fix, I said, well, Don I said, I can't fix this the way it is. I'm going to have to take the back off this. And he jumps in my face and says, take the back off a Lloyd Ro lower mandolin. Are you nuts? And I said, well, I don't have to do that. I can just leave it like it is and dob some glue in there, and uh, it'll come apart in about a month. If that's what you want, that's what I'll do. And he says, nope, I want you to fix it right, because he says, I know you'll fix it right. So I took the back off, cleaned all of the glue off of there that was on there, and then glued it back on with tight bond, uh, which I know is kind of a sin for a Lloyd Lohr mandolin, but that's what I did, and the back never came off again. Um, Don played it the rest of his life and it worked fine. Now, the neck joint that came loose, you can tell in McClanahan's video that somebody had monkeyed with that neck also. That wasn't me. I never monkeyed with that neck at all. So somebody had put a dowel pin in there and some other shim wood or something in there. That wasn't me. I, didn't, I never messed with any of that. All I did was take the back off, put it back on. What I did held. Um, but anyway... So, but I think McClanahan did a really nice job, and I, I sent him a text message, or I s made a comment in his video that I thought he did a wonderful job, and that I thought Don would be smiling down from heaven. Bonzo, Jerry, does uh, the customer pay the shipping both ways? Common sense tells me he does, and how do you know how to estimate charges without seeing the instrument? 
Well, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I had to, they ship it on their nickel here, and then I uh, box it up and weigh it and get the exact cost, and then I send them an invoice for the exact cost, and they pay that. Or I just include it in their total invoice, and they pay that. It was the normal way to do it. Um, yeah, I, you can't, especially the way shipping's gone these days. Shipping's gone out of sight now. That's another reason why I just got tired of dealing with it. And, and if you notice the last year or two, I didn't accept shipped in instruments anymore because I just didn't want to deal with it. It has just gone out of sight on the shipping charges. Bill Rhodes, uh, Jerry, what is your wife get your shirts? What is your wife get your shirts? Um, I guess, where does she get them or whatever? We, I'm not a fashion person, so most of my stuff comes from Walmart or someplace like that. So I, I really don't know. I, I, that's another thing is I rarely ever go into a clothing store or anything like that. I'll go once in a blue moon, you know, but pair, buy a pair of blue jeans or something. That's about it. I mean, I just, I, I, I've said before, there is not one single person on this earth, not one, that cares less about fashion than I do. And it doesn't matter what you can make your smart comments if you want. Well, that's obvious. We can tell that. I, it's fine. Just, I could care less. This much, earthworms are way more important to me than fashion. Uh, yeah, when you start caring about fashion, I think something's missing in your personality, in my opinion. Um, not that you want to go around looking like a slob. That's not my point. Um, but when that becomes the thing that drives your life, and it does for a lot of people, I think there's something missing. Uh, that's what I think. But I could care less about fashion. It never did make any difference to me. You know, all the other kids were wearing their whatever kind of stuff. And, you know, as a kid, you want to kind of fit in a little bit. And so to some degree, I tried to fit in a little bit. But I didn't go very far with it, I can tell you that. Uh, it just was never important to me, and it never has been, never will be. Um, could care less. Just flat care less. There's nothing I care less about than fashion. Preston Johnson. Uh, did I read that one already? Um, Preston Johnson. Thank you, Jerry, for playing and singing. Made my day. Don't stop playing. Well, thank you, Preston. I appreciate it. I really, I, I'm not saying it to get sympathy, but I really am thinking about just giving up the plan and all that. I really am. I'm just about over it. Dottie Hildebrandt, Jerry, what it, I was saying is last night we signed in for the video, Rod and myself, and this morning it's not on there. Hmm. You know, well, I don't know how to help you with that part. I uh, assume that's a YouTube or, or a Google thing or something, you know. Um, just don't know. Gordon Nagy or Nagy, possibly. You're still a pretty good picker. I give up once in a while, but I always change my mind. 82 years old. Time takes its toll. Yeah, it does. Um, Paul Aker says, thumbs up, everybody. Appreciate that if you would do that. Dottie Hildebrand, Jerry... We've got 194 viewers, by the way, right now, so that's pretty good. Please don't give up the music. Uh, with that much talent, it would be a sin. Well, thank you, Dottie. I appreciate that. Lester Cunningham. Jerry, don't quit playing. I had an injury 50 years ago. Cut the tendons on my noting arm. Have numb fingers, but sp won't spread. I'm 82, still trying to play. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I, I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of reasons why I'm thinking about giving it up. But anyway, um, I've got songs on the radio, not seen any money. <laughs> Tim says, says that. Yeah, you know, I've had lots and lots and lots and lots of songs played on the radio. Lots of them. I mean, I couldn't even begin to tell you how many and on, and on what stations and really all around the world because we um I, I released two songs on what they call the prime cuts of bluegrass it was albums that used to come out i think there was maybe 50 or 60 in the series something like that and i don't remember which album we were on 21 or something i mean it was it was one of the relatively early ones and i released uh, phantom 614 
and I released uh, Seminole Wind. I, I think I was the first one to cut Seminole Wind in bluegrass. I really do think so. And we got fan letters from all over the world on Seminole Wind. We really did. I got a few royalty checks for Seminole Wind. Not very much, to be honest with you. Not as much as Vine Cover Church, actually. Um, of course, we released, we, you know, Vine Cover Church got played on a lot of stations, too. Even my version got played a lot. Um, most of the Vine Covered Church revenue came from Ireland, I think, if I'm not mistaken. I think most of it came from Ireland, it, definitely the UK. So it was played more over there than it really was over here. Um, uh, and then the, the, the uh, Phantom 614 was also released at the same time that I released Seminole Wind. And the feedback I got on Phantom 614, and I got a royalty check or two on Phantom 614, but the feedback I got from the DJs, because see, the DJs, that was one of the things about the prime cuts of Bluegrass, is the DJs that get those cuts send in their feedback on each song. And the feedback I got on Phantom 614, I thought was pretty funny, was... Uh, uh, this is this fake? There's no way anybody would name a, a horse Phantom 614. <laughs> and several DJs said stuff like that. What a stupid name for a horse or something like that, you know. And I'd say, well, I tried to name it Phantom 309. And then most of the DJs would have got it because most of the DJs would have known about the song Phantom 309, which was a Red Sovine song. <sighs> But that didn't work out that way because my dad wouldn't let me name it that. So I named him Phantom 614, which was 614 was our address at the time. 614 Kurz Mill Road. So that's how it worked out that way. And it was a true story, of course, as all of you know that, I'm sure. Okay, moving on. <laughs> uh, okay, on down. Um... F style is the best. Somebody says two yards there says that. Well, you know, in my opinion, they're the best. But then again, there's lots of guys that say the A styles are the best and they love the A styles. And that's fine. If that's what you into, just knock yourself out. I got no problem with that. I really don't. I'm not trying to make it sound like I'm thumbing my nose at them because I'm not. A styles are fine. They're just fine. They sound great. It's more about how good do they play and how do they sound. That's really what it's all about. But then if you can get that, then from my perspective, why not just step up to the F style, which has more style in addition to the sound and all that. That's to me is, I don't know. It's, I don't know. It's, it's, you know, it, I, I'm just trying to get, think of a car analogy, but the problem is with car analogies, there's a lot of snobbish stuff with that. And I don't mean it that way. Um, I mean, you know, most any car, I'll get you there, but you could step up to the comfort of a Cadillac, you know, if you want, or the, or something else that's a little more stylish. Now, again, you might go say, well, that sounds contradictory about your fashion and all that. Well, it probably is a little contradictory. I'll give you that. But it just, it's just nice to, to play a, a style mandolin. They look cool. They, they sound just as good as the A styles and vice versa. So, but they also look cool. So, that's really my only reason. And, and I guess if I really got down to the roots of it, and, you know, with my psychology training that I've had, the real root of it, that's what my Uncle Don played, you know, and he was my inspiration. So why wouldn't I play an F-style, you know? So there you go. Uh, <clears throat> John Schneider says, Jerry loved the show. Recently reassembled an old mandolin my brother had. It was in pieces, structurally fine. No can... Oh, I, it scrolled on me while I was reading that. Where did it go? No can figure who made it. Um, like to send some pics, maybe you would know. Um, well, I might know, but honestly, I doubt it, to be honest with you, uh, uh, John. And the reason that I doubt it is because there were gazillions of them made. Uh, and by lots and lots and lots of companies. If it's not obviously a Gibson or obviously sometimes a Martin is, eh, I don't know. 
you know, if it's not a name brand one like a, a Gibson or a Kentucky or an Alvarez or, you know, one of the name brands, and of course there's many, many more now, um, Flatiron and I don't know, there's just a gazillion of them, Eastman and so I, I really, I doubt I could tell you if it doesn't have a label in it or anything or it doesn't have any particular markings. But if it's really old, it, man, there was a bunch of them. There was Washburn, there was, I don't know, Vega or something, and there was, uh, I don't know, there's a bunch of them that y y you'd be better off doing Google searches, quite honestly. That's probably how you'll find it if you, if you do Google searches and compare it and try to describe what you see in your mandolin and do a Google search on what you see on your description and you'll very likely find it. Joe Knoll says 8,000 and then he has question marks and 8,000 means nothing to me. You're talking about the cost of the mandolin maybe? I, I don't know. I don't know what that means. Mike Jones, yeah, I don't get the shipping you guys have in from Canada and it cost like $30 to get a, a file shipped from Stumac and it took uh, one month. Got a file from Crimson one week, uh, five bucks shipping from England. Yeah, it's, it, well, the shipping thing is really crazy these days. Um, the little guy will get nailed on shipping and, uh, I never tried to make money on the shipping. Uh, I really never did. Uh, what I would also do, quite honestly, because I'm 20 miles from from uh, Rolla, which is where we would have to go to ship it, because, you know, they don't come out here. I mean, you can get them to do it, but that's an extra cost. So I would drive to Rolla, and, you know, most of the time back then, I was going to town anyway a lot, so... Uh, I don't hardly ever go to town now, but at that time when I was working on instruments, I was going to town a lot anyway to pick up supplies and different things all the time. So um, I, I would just generally, in, you know, include it in the trip into town and then drop it off at the shipping place. But I would typ typically tack on $10 to the shipping for my trip for out and back. And that would help cover my the cost of my gas and a little bit of my time. And, you know, it, 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 it didn't really cover it. Uh, most I think most people in my situation having to drive that far one way, 20 miles, would have probably charged more than $10. But I tried to be really fair, and I didn't try to make money on the shipping. But, uh, but also, the other reason I did that $10, too, and it, it happened a lot, is uh, especially with... Uh, I don't remember it happening with UPS, but with uh, FedEx, they'd come back and bill you again. Like you'd ship a, you know, you using their information, you know, to ship the instrument. And you'd ship it to, say, Georgia or someplace. Well, then maybe two months later, they would come back and charge you. And they wouldn't tell you why. They wouldn't associate it to anything. They'd charge you $10 or $20 or something. Well, what the hell is this for? You know, I mean, it wouldn't really, it just make me mad. You know, I'd get these charges. And, when you finally get it tracked down, it was because you shipped that guitar to, uh, you know, Georgia, and they felt it, dis you know, they added on some extra charges. You know, it's, uh, it was such a racket. So that was another reason. I just wanted to give it up, and uh, it happened a lot. It didn't just happen once, trust me. And so that's why I also tacked on that $10 was partly to cover those things that would happen, you know, and they did happen. <clears throat> All right, moving on. Oh, uh, let's see. Tim Rickett says, awesome. Well, thank you. Mine all are gospel, though. Okay, well, on songs, most of my... Well, you know, I've written a lot. I've written a lot of both, on both sides. I've written a lot of gospel. I've written a lot of uh, just standard or whatever. Secular. Uh, Mike Jones, to be fair, Stu Mac refunded my money when I asked about the different size tool didn't even ask for the old one back good service that way yeah stumac has always treated me right uh, and what i did because i ordered from stumac a lot i just paid their one-time fee up front which i it was it was real reasonable it was like 50 dollars a year or something like that and then you didn't have to pay you got free shipping so that's the way to do it if you're if you know you're going to be ordering a lot from stumac just pay their membership fee or whatever you want to call it and uh, then you get free shipping it was worth it way worth it to me bill jerry uh bill J 
uh, is the username, Jerry. My wife says, if the clothing stores depended on me for support, they'd go out of business. Yeah, I'm not into styles either. Well, that's that's me. I, I mean, I'll go when I have to go. Or if I'm in there and I go, oh, I need another pair of blue jeans, I'll walk over and get a pair of blue jeans. And I could care less what the brand says. If it's cheap, that's what I buy. <laughs> I could. I could care less. Could care less. Nobody could care less than me. Kenneth Ennis. <laughs> Jerry, never give up music. I did that when COVID started, but I couldn't stay out of it. Stay strong and keep on chirping. Thanks. Spike Moto, John Robert Snyder, contact Gruen Guitars. They may be able to tell you who made it. Uh, they were able to identify an obscure 1930s mandolin on my dad uh, played. Yeah, that's a good point. Gruen might be able to tell you. Um, Gruen, I talked to him one time years ago, and, and he's the reason that I started building my own. <laughs> I drove all the way down there. You've heard me tell the story. I drove all the way down there because he had a 1924, November 28th, 1924, F-Style Lloyd Lore Gibson signed by Lloyd Lore, and he had it in his store, and he wouldn't price it over the phone. At the time, they were selling for about eight thousand dollars, roughly six to eight thousand, actually. And I expected to pay the eight thousand. I figured he's going to want eight thousand for it, or in that neighborhood, he might want eighty-five. You know, I figured he'd jab me a little bit. So when I got down there, you know, I talked to him on the phone, and he wouldn't price it. So when I drove all the way down there, he priced it, and he said, and I, it, I loved it. It was a great man, and it had my birthday in it, November twenty-eighth. 1924. My birthday is November 28, 1954. So exactly 30 years to the day. So uh, he says, yeah, I want 12,500 and it's firm. I'm not taking a penny less. So I handed it back to him and I turned around and drove back to St. Louis. And because um, I couldn't afford the 8,000, really, I really couldn't. But I was just going to make myself buy the 8,000 and just bite the bullet. Now, no one then, if I knew then what I know now, I'd have bought a whole truckload of them. You know, I'd have financed my house. Uh, whatever I would have had to done, you know, mortgage my house. But anyway, the point is that, that on that trip back, that's what made my mind up. I'm going to build my own and I don't care. I'm just going to build my own. And then my uncle tried to talk me out of that. He says, son, he says, don't do that. He says, I've, I've, played every handmade mandolin in the country. He said, ain't none of them any good. You know, you got to remember, this is back in the 70s, 80s time frame, and Don was even earlier than that, mostly. And uh, he said, hey, none of them any good. Just, you know, just uh, get you a Lloyd Lore and be done with it. So when I built it, I took it and showed it to him. And you, saw, uh, you heard me say his first reaction was he picked it for, he didn't have it in his hand in a minute. He, and he says, uh, well, it plays good, but it ain't got no chop. And he hands it right back to me. And uh, then he saw me jamming about 100 yards from where he was sitting. And he gets off, off that tailgate of that truck and walks 100 yards to me. He says, son, I was wrong about that mandolin. He says, that thing has got a heck of a chop. He says, I can hear that over every other instrument in the, in the place. He says, that mandolin is killer. And, and so, obviously, that brightened my day. And then um, a few years later after that, he says, I, he says, there's just something I got to tell you. And I said, what is that? He says, well, if I wasn't playing uh, a Lloyd Lore and one of the finest Lloyd Lores ever built, he says, I, I'd be playing your mandolin. He says, I just want you to know that. And, um, and the finest Lloyd Lore ever built, uh, you know, people consider it to be Don Brown, I mean, uh, Bill Monroe's mandolin. But quite honestly... Don Brown's, in my opinion, at least the way Don played it on stage next to Bill Monroe, just walked all over Bill Monroe, just walked all over him. And, and it wasn't necessarily just the way Bill played and the way Don played. The mandolin just seemed like a better mandolin to me. And, you know, obviously I'm biased. But the whole place wasn't biased, and the whole place just dang near gave him a standing ovation when he took his break on that mandolin. A yeah, pretty amazing mandolin. That, that was one amazing mandolin. It really was. It was one powerful axe. 
Uh, moving on down, and you know, and I just got lucky to take that one apart, and, and I built all of my mandolins within a thousandth of an inch, and I'm not kidding about that. I mean, I you know, use my calipers and get to within a thousandth of an inch in all the areas that I measured. So if any mandolins are close to that one, mine are the ones that are close to that mandolin. And those are the only measurements I've never given out, and people keep saying, why don't you give them out? You're just being stingy. And, well, you know, maybe I am. I've given out everything else. Some of the things people don't even want to hear, I've given it out anyway, you know, like the humidity thing and the glue thing and some of those things. A lot of people just don't want to hear it. But I give it out and you, you can have it and do what you want with it, but I'm not giving out those particular measurements. It's just something I'm keeping to myself. That's the only thing I've ever kept to myself. Uh, Moving on down, two yards. UPS does the same thing. Months later, they'll tack on extra charges. Yeah, yeah, and you know, if, even that wouldn't be so bad if they'd tell you why and what it was for and all that, but they don't. They just said, you, you got to pay an extra $20. Too bad, so sad, just stick it in your left ear. That's kind of the way they act. They could just give a rip. Bill Roach, uh, been playing the mandolin for about a year. This one's got that thing in there. I can't read it all. A year, and I'm ready to go to jam. Top five tunes should learn. Uh, well, Bill, I, that's a good one on me, too. I, I, I never, ever, and I still don't, consider myself an instrumentalist. In other words, I... The lead playing and all that, that wasn't where it was out for me. Even though I try to play lead, you know, um, I never have thought of myself as a lead player that much. Um, it was more like we just put the band together and we would play and sing our, our tunes, you know. Um, so it was more of a band effort for me. But <clears throat> the instrumental tunes, I never learned a ton of them, to be honest with you. But, you know, it's hard to go wrong with your fiddle tunes. Like, you know, on a mandolin, uh, uh, like Old Joe Clark and um, uh, Angelina Baker, um, uh, Soldier's Joy, those are some of the, you know, fairly popular mandolin tunes, uh, standard old-timey tunes and stuff. Uh, there's a lot of other ones too uh, that are a little more progressive. Uh, I think Rebecca is one written that a lot of mandolin players like to play. Uh, that was a hard one for me. I never did do very well with Rebecca. I could play it, but it just wasn't very good. Um, I don't know, just a, a bunch of tunes. That, the comment section would be better to ask than me on that, honestly. Well, I guess I'm going to let that be it. Uh, thank you guys for watching today. I'm sure I went way over again. Yeah, we're an hour and a, 37 minutes past the, the hour. Um, and we've, our viewers have dropped off to 186. But still, that's quite a few viewers. So thank you all for sticking with me. And I appreciate it very much. We will be back tomorrow with something else. And I don't know what it'll be, but we'll figure it out. Yeah.